We are discussing section 4.1 of Rosen's Discrete Mathematics and Its Applications, 7th edition. In this section, we'll be discussing these topics. First, we start with definition of division. If A and B are integers with A non-zero, then A divides B if there exists an integer C such that B equals A times C. When A divides B, we say that A is a factor or divisor of B and that B is a multiple of A. We have a symbol to uh, denote this, it's a vertical bar. And you see A vertical bar B, you can read that as A divides B. And of course, if A divides B, then B over A is an integer. And if A does not divide B, we take that same symbol and put a line through it as shown. So for the first example, we've got two propositions, three divides seven and three divides 12, which is true and which is false. Well, three does not divide seven because there's no integer which when multiplied by three gives seven. So that's a false proposition. And three divides 12 because there is an integer, namely four, which when multiplied by three gives 12. All right, so let's talk about divisibility's properties. We have a theorem to state. Theorem one, we've got A, B, and C integers and A non-zero. The theorem has three parts. The first part says that if A divides B and A divides C, then A divides their sum. The second part states that if A divides B, then A divides B times C for all integers C. And the third part states that if A divides B and B divides C, then A divides C. And we'll do a proof of the first part, and you can use the pattern that I show to do proofs for the second and third parts. So with proving this type of theorem, uh, we start by assuming the hypothesis for part one, which is that A divides B and A divides C. Then as often follows, we take advantage of a, of a definition that we have heard recently, like the one on the previous slide. And since A divides B, we know that there is an integer, we'll call it S, so that B equals A times S. And since A divides C, by that same definition, there must be an integer, we'll call it T such that c is equal to a times t. Now that we have two equations, we can uh, add respective sides of those and come up with a new equation. And we can get b plus c is equal to a times the quantity s plus t. Well, s plus t is also an integer. And since b plus c equals a times an integer, that means a divides b plus c by definition. And the proof is done for part one. And whenever we've done with a proof, um, we'll see a little black arrow pop up or black triangle point to the left. And that's an indicator that we've completed a proof. Um, and I, again, I've asked the students to do proofs for part two and three using that same pattern. Uh, we have a follow-on theorem called a corollary that kind of takes advantage of these uh, properties. We have A, B, and C integers, A non-zero. Uh, and if A divides B and A divides C, then A divides all linear combinations of B and C where the coefficients are integers. And the way we could prove that is to show that, well, if A divides B, A divides M times B by part two, and also A divides C, then A divides N times C by part two, and so A divides those two numbers, that A, divide, A will divide their sum using part one. And you should be able to show that using uh, the theorem. I have another theorem. Um, whenever we take an integer and divide it by a positive integer, we get a quotient and a remainder. Um, should be familiar to you from long division, perhaps. Note that we will always be dividing by a positive integer. Um, the, the integer we're dividing into may be negative or positive, but the one we're dividing by will always be positive. Um, the statement is traditionally called the division algorithm, but it's really a theorem. And here's what it states. If A is an integer and D is a positive integer, 
Then there are unique integers, Q and R, that's the quotient and remainder, where the remainder has to be strictly less than the D and non-negative, uh, such that A is equal to D times Q plus R. Well, we have already know what Q and R are, but what are A and D? We do have names for them. We'll talk about them. D is called the divisor, the thing we're using to do the dividing. That's the divisor. The dividend is A, that's the largest uh, number in, ma in magnitude on the left side of the equation. And then again, Q is quotient and R is remainder. Now we say that Q and R are unique with inputs A and D, that means they're a, um, uh, a function of A and D. So we can write a symbol for their functions and we use div and mod to uh, denote those functions. So the quotient uh, from having A divided by D is called A div D. And the remainder uh, when A is divided by D is A mod D. And I'll give mathematical expressions for those in just a second. But um, let's do a couple of examples first. We have a dividend of 101 and a divisor of 11, what are the quotient and remainder? Well, 11 goes into 101 nine times, and then there that nine times 11 is 99. I have two more to get to 101. So a quotient is nine and the remainder is two. We could say that nine is equal to 101 div 11, and the remainder is uh, 101 mod 11. All right, what about when we have a negative dividend? So when negative 11 is divided by three, well, I get negative three and two thirds, but that's not the quotient. The quotient has to be an integer. And we end up going to, it's either gonna be negative three or negative four, but we always go down lower. So the quotient will be negative four. And the reason we need to do that is so that the remainder is positive. So three times negative four is negative 12. Then I need to do a plus one to get to negative 11. So the remainder will be one. So uh, negative 11 div three is negative four. And the remainder is uh, negative 11 mod three is one. All right, so let's look at some mathematical expressions for these functions. All right, so a div d is really just the the fraction, uh, and you take what is called the floor function of that fraction, a divided by d, a over d, and the floor function. The floor function is the integer that is the next integer down that is less than or equal to a divided by d. So if a divided by d is an integer, then the floor function doesn't do anything. Uh, as in the case of 101 divided by 11, we get nine and a fraction. Well, the floor function of nine and a fraction is nine. That's our quotient. For negative 11 divided by three, we get negative three and a fraction. Well, the floor function of that is going to be negative four. So the quotient is negative four. All right, now it's important that I point out an error in your textbook. Um, seventh edition has an incorrect function incorrect expression for the mod function. And here's the correct one. So the remainder is just the dividend minus the divisor times the quotient, basically taking that formula a equal dq plus r and solving for r. Um, I think it is um, more intuitive, at least for me, to divide d from both of those terms and put it out to the side. And I have it like this, where I have the remainder is the, um, the fraction or the ratio of the divisor of the dividend minus the quotient, and then that difference multiplied by D. And I find that that's very easy to work out on a calculator, which I'll show next. So let's do 101 divided by, oops, divided by 11, and we get nine and a fraction. 
The quotient is nine because that's the floor function of nine in a fraction. So I'm going to subtract the quotient. And I get a fraction that I will multiply by my divisor. And there's my remainder of two, like we saw earlier. So uh, take the ratio, subtract the quotient, multiply by the divisor. Let's do it for negative 11 and 3. So negative 11 divided by 3 is negative 3 in a fraction. The floor function of negative 3 in a fraction is negative 4. So I subtract negative 4. And now I multiply by my divisor. 